Good morning. There we are. Come on down, my little love bugs. It's almost Valentine's Day. Did you get your boxes done? Everybody make a box? Did you? Good. Excellent. You're right in front of me, aren't you? Hey, and you guys got a new brother. What a cool week. I'm telling you. I am telling you. You know what? I wanted to show you some pictures. Because I think they're very neat. Do you see that picture? What, what? It is a bald eagle. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me show you this one, too. Another bald eagle. Yeah. Now, this one and another bald eagle. Because I wanted to show you this one. Because did you know that, that bald eagles build their nests really high up in the tree? Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure why they do it. But they, they love to soar and fly up high. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's easier to teach their babies when they build the nest, right? And here's another one of an eagle flying from his nest, uh, or her nest, or his nest. Did the mamas and the daddies both take care of the babies. Did you know that? I know. Isn't that pretty? They're just really, really pretty pictures, I thought. And, you know, they build... They build their their nest high in the tree, and in the winter time, and sometimes in the spring, it can get really rainy and icy and cold, and their babies are in there. Do you know what they do? The 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 dad eagle and the mom eagle, whoever's turn it is, they spread their wings out and they cover their babies if it's rainy and cold or icy or snowy. Did you know that? Yeah, they do. They do this. Like, and 
cover their babies so they don't get wet. Isn't that, isn't that cool? <laughs> Who, that was for whoever in the back didn't see it. So, um, you know, our own parents take care of us, don't they? Sometimes if we're scared, do they, they pull us in and they hold us tight? Or sometimes if we're scared at night, we get in bed with them and they, they cuddle us or they get in our bed and cuddle us. Isn't that, that cool? Do you know who else does that? Sometimes if we can't find our parents right, we know that God is always, always, always with us. He will always take care of us. That is such a great promise. And, you know, when we have our own stormy nights and scary nights, and we might not be able to find somebody, he is there. God is there, and we can ask him for, for help. You know, sometimes people who don't know Jesus, who don't know God, think that because we can't see him, he's not there. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Because we know that that's not true. We know that in Hebrews 13, 5, it says that we should be content with what we have. For God himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you. You know, we know that we have the Bible, we have prayer, and we have the ability to just call on him and he will take care of us because we are his children. That's, that's the promise. Isn't that cool? It's very cool. You know what else he says? Just like that eagle in Psalm 91, it says, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. That means protection. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. He loves us so much. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful that you promise to be with us always. Please help us to continue to learn more about you so that even though we cannot see you, we know you are here. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. Well, that video gave away what we're going to talk about this morning, right? Jeremy, make sure nobody leaves today. Thank you. That's why he's sitting over there. I, I told him to make sure that the doors stay closed. How's everyone doing this week so far? Good. Last week, if you missed our message, we talked about worship, and uh, it is up on the YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed to that so that you don't miss any of our messages, I encourage that you go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. But all of the videos are now available on our website. If you have not checked out our new website, it is fbcmawikwa.org. So all of them are there as well. You can go ahead and check those out. I think it might be a little easier on the website to go ahead and, and check those out. Last week when we talked about worship, I thought it was really neat. We were able to take some little white pieces of paper and write down one word that gets in the way of worship. One word that we haven't dealt with that gets in the way of every time we come into church or even throughout the week that hinders us from true transformational worship with our Lord and Savior. And, and I requested that nobody writes their names down on that piece of paper, and thankfully everybody listened. There was no names. And I'm not original. I didn't come up with this idea of tacking those pieces of paper up on the cross, so don't give me credit for it. I've seen this done at many churches before, and it was an opportunity. It is an opportunity for pastors to be able to go and pray over those pieces of paper. And I'm also going to let all of you know that you're not original in the things that you wrote down. Every church and every person has about four or five things that they write down. Because Satan is not original either. He doesn't, he doesn't come up with new things. He always goes after the same things. And those things are pride. Those things are selfishness. Those things are envy. And a big one on there is finances. Those things are... Those things are lusting after the things of the world that are always on our mind. Work. We're thinking about the bills that we have to pay. We're thinking about that. And so today we're going to extend our worship. We're going to extend our, our worship um, sermon, I guess you could say, and how we worship. And today's sermon is called Living Generously. Living generously and, and what that means. Today, I'm going to address the topic of tithing. We're going to address the topic of tithing, and we're going to see what the Bible has to say about that. Tithing and giving. Money is a very touchy subject, isn't it? It's a very touchy subject. Just admit it. Say yes. Okay. Thank you. But Jesus tells us in Matthew, where your treasure is, your heart is. Why is that? Why is money so touchy? Why do we get so uptight about it? Why? Because money buys us the things that we want. It pays for the things we need. And money, let's face it, it's our sustenance of life here on this earth, right? And so before we dive in to exactly what God has to tell us about money and where our treasure is, let's go before him. In prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would be with us today and especially open up our hearts and our minds when we talk about such a, such a subject that just causes controversy and, 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 a, and, and, a, and a time for us to shut down and, and, and not listen to what you have to say to us about this. Lord, I ask that we would just listen to what you have to say in your word. Jesus, we love you and we worship you. Amen. I need a $10 bill. A $10 bill is not as common as many of the others. I don't know why. People have lots of singles, which aren't worth anything anymore. And lots of people have 20s. But does anybody have a $10 bill? But I need a crisp, nice $10 bill. I need, I need it for a bill. Do you have? You, or Bob, you've got one? You've got one? You got it. It's got to be a new, newer crisp one, though, for this. You got one? I just need a 10. 
No, this one's not. That's a farmer. That's a farmer ten. <laughs> Anybody got it? This one's kind of, see how it's kind of wrinkly? It'll spin. It'll spin. <laughs> here, let me see this one. Here, Donnie, I'm going to give you this. I got one here. Don, Donnie, here. He says he doesn't want it. I'm going to give it back to you. This is, she'll take it. Okay, there you go. All right, you're going to have to fight over that ten. Bob, this is, this is yours, right? Okay. It still says, where's it at? Where's it in God, reach what? in God we trust on it? There it is. It's on the back. All right, see this? Everybody agree this is a $10 bill? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Now I need a $20 bill. Anybody got a 20? I need a new crisp $20. Now he's got one. <laughs> I got one offer on a $20 bill. Oh, he doesn't have one. <laughs> There was a lot less people. <laughs> That's all right. I got one. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> See, a lot less people stood up for a 20 after I put that 10 in my pocket. <laughs> after we go to the 50, I think I'm, <laughs> we might lose you, right? <laughs> we might lose you. Why is that? Why is that? All I had to do was ask for it one time, and I took it, and I said, nope, this is mine now. We get so possessive of money, don't we? We get so, that's mine. That's mine. Right? We get so possessive of that. I get people that ask me all the time, Pastor, do I have to tithe 10% of my net or 10% of my gross? What is it? Some of, you, some of you have even talked to me about that. What is it? Well, pastor, if I tithe 10% of my gross, do I have to tithe my tax return? What is that? What is a tax return anymore, really? But, but, but because I've already paid my tithe on the gross, then I shouldn't have to tithe my tax return. What about the 50 bucks that grandma and grandpa put in my birthday card? Do I really have to tithe that? Come on. Really? Today's big idea is open-handed, living open-handedly. And we're going to dive into to that in a little bit and what it means. But before we go any further on tithing, let's define it. Let's define what tithing is. I looked it up. This is what Webster's Dictionary had to tell me about tithing. Tithing is a tenth or a tenth of a part of something. We all agree on that, right? Okay. It's a tenth. A part of something paid as a voluntary contribution or as a tax, especially for support of a religious establishment. Y'all are getting taxed coming to church. You get taxed everywhere else. You might as well get taxed when you come to church, right? Well, look at that. Okay, so it's a 10% tax when you come to church. Okay, so what was it for? What was the tithe for? So... I go where I always go. I go here. Let's figure it out. We can find it in Numbers 18.21. It's not up on the screen, but you can go there if you want to, if you don't take my word for it. It says in Numbers 18.21, To the Levites I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meetings. That's what it says in, in Numbers 18.21. Okay. So the tithe was a payment or a tax to the Levites. And if you don't remember that story or what happened, was when all of the tribes got divided up, the tribes of Israel, the Levites didn't have any land. They didn't have an inheritance of land. And so God said that because they don't, all of the rest of the tribes need to give 10% to them. And the Levites were in charge of the temple. Makes sense, right? We've got to give to them because they don't have anything. So basically, the priests and the Levites had to give this tithe. All right, so y'all are coming to church. You need to give your 10% to me, right? Y'all are like, this is, this is messed up. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, so now we know what a tithe is for. Okay, so 10%. So the first tithe was what they call the Levitical tithe or the sacred tithe that goes to the Levites. But wait, there's more. Let's keep going. Deuteronomy 14.22, it says this. If you want to turn there, you can. It's not going to be up on the screen, but I'm going to read what it says. You shall tithe all of the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year and before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. This is a second tithe. This is what they called the tithe of the feast. What it was was that you were commanded to take 10% of your, of your harvest or your, of your income this is a second 10%. So now we're up to 20. And you were supposed to spend it on yourselves. Basically, they were saying, go to a conference, spend it on the Levites because they don't have anything for themselves, and go worship. So you've already taken 10% and you've given it to the tent of meeting. Now you're taking another 10% and you're going to worship with it. Now we're up to 20. But wait, there's more. Let's keep going. Deuteronomy 14.28 says this. At the end of every three years, you shall, out of the tithe of your produce, in the same year, and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or an inheritance with you, and the sojourner, which is a temporary resident, the fatherless and the widow, who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand that you do. This is a tithe for the poor. Every three years, you're commanded to take 10%. Now, if you take 10% divided by three, my math says 3.3 repeated percent. So now we are up to 23.33333%. Is my math correct? Okay. So, let's go back to the original question. Pastor, do I have to tithe 10% of my gross or 10% of my net? And I say, that's not the right question. That's not the right question. So, do we have to tithe all of that stuff? Do we have to? Let's turn to 2 Chronicles 31.4. This will be up on the screen. And he, God, commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the Levites that they may give themselves to the law of the Lord. The commandment then was for the Israelites to give the tithes according to Mosaic law. That's something that they had to live by back then. They were commanded to do so. And so my question is, is today are we under Mosaic law? Do we live under the law? My answer is no, we are not under the law. Leadership of this church is like, Pastor, where are you going with this? This isn't what we talked about. Paul says this in Romans 7, 4. You also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So here's where Paul says that you really are no longer under the law. So, in the Old Testament, we were under the law, and Paul is telling you that we are no longer under the law. Why? Because of Christ. If you are following along in your notes under point number one, 
We are now in Christ so that we can produce fruit for the Lord. In the Old Testament, Israel was under the old Mosaic law. There was a system. There was a system in place for worship. There was a system in place for tithing. There was a system that we had to follow, or that they had to follow, I should say. And then Jesus came. Jesus came. He died on the cross for our sins. Church, hear me on this. If you only listen to one thing today, one thing, Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we did not have to spend eternity in hell, a real place that exists. He died on the cross for our sins so that if we believe that he died on the cross for our sins and we profess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and choose to follow him, put our old lives behind us and follow him, Followed by believers' baptism. That's the next step after. That is salvation. But it is a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. Amen? Okay. That is not something that can wait. If you have not done that, church, this message can wait. Everything can wait. So hear me on that. That is salvation. So before Jesus, there was the old law that we had to follow. Now Jesus came. There's salvation. You receive the free gift of salvation. And then what? All of that old stuff is gone. But since you have received this free gift of salvation so that we didn't have to spend eternity in hell because of our sins, all of that is taken away. Now... Jesus says something else about giving. You have received this gift. Christians are now turning around and giving their lives to him. In the early church, the Christians were literally giving their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the church today, in some areas of the world, they are still literally giving their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's how important it is. Amen? They're, they're doing it. But so many Christians today refuse to even live for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They won't. They won't do it. And so today, that's why the sermon is called Living Generously. What does that even mean? So if we're not living under old Mosaic law of tithing, then what do we give? And how do we do it? And that's what we want to talk about today. Today we are going to spend most of our time in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we are going to, we are going to dissect Chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, I believe. So if you want to be in your Bibles there, I'm going to also have it up on the screen. Our first point this morning is whoever gives little will receive little. Whoever gives little will receive little. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And this is kind of a, a universal idea. We know this. There's farmers in the room here, right? People here farm? Yes? If you want to save money farming, do you buy less seeds to plant? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. You're not going to buy less seeds and think that you're going to just still get the same crop. You can cut corners other places, but it's not buying seed. If you want a bountiful harvest, you are going to plant more seeds. You're going to care for those seeds. Yes? Okay. Paul also wrote this in Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whoever sows will also reap. Whoever sows will also reap.
We all have those lazy co I'm going to use the word lazy. Can I say lazy in church? We all, we all have lazy coworkers. We've had them. And if you don't know one of them, maybe it's you. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. But they've worked and they've worked and they've worked for years where you are. And then they get so frustrated that they don't get promoted. They don't move anywhere. They don't go anywhere. And the boss just passes right over them and goes to you that you've been there for six months. And they're like, why? Well, they just do enough to get by. That's why. They just do enough to get by, which I guess if that's their speed, if that's all they want, so be it. We all know those people. But their performance and their reward align. Their performance and their reward align. If you choose to take shortcuts, that's what you're going to get. And that's what, that's what God is saying here. That's what, I'm sorry, that's what Paul's writing here. But the same is true in the kingdom of heaven. What you give is what you're going to receive. What you monetarily give, what you serve with your time, what you go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's what you're going to get in, in return. It says that, there that you can suffer loss in heaven. What that, I'm sorry, but when it says that you can suffer loss in heaven, I don't want to know what that is. I don't want to find out. So if, if you are going to reap what you sow, if you're going to get little, when you plant little, what is the opposite? What is the obvious opposite? It's point number two. Whoever gives greatly will receive much. And that is the second half of verse six. Proverbs 11.25 says a generous person will prosper. Again, another universal idea. Whoever gives much will receive much. Generous people prosper, right? They just do. You work hard, you're going to get much. I've never met a really rich person that didn't work hard for it unless it was just all handed to them. Unless they inherited all of it. But again, I've met people that inherit a lot of money that just blow it. Because they don't know the value of a dollar. I've met, or I've not met, but I've heard of people that have won the lottery and were bankrupt within a year or two. It just, it doesn't usually work out that way. It's no mistake that Paul used the analogy of sowing seeds. He did that on purpose because remember the parable of sowing seeds that Jesus used. And I believe it was in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, sowing seeds. Remember when Jesus talked about the seeds that lay, fell on the rocks or in the weeds. The, the, the seeds that grew much were the seeds that were down in fertile, good soil. That's where you get the bountiful, the bountiful harvest. When we give our time, when we give our resources with proper care of the seeds, that is when we get a harvest for the kingdom of God. Following along in our points this morning under point number two, God will bless a generous giver. And you ask, you say, Pastor Chris, what is a generous giver? Like, okay, we're talking about generous giving. Define generous because because people are always, I don't want to say people, a lot of people are always like, well, I'm writing the tithing check or I'm writing the giving check. What, what should that be? Like, what is, what is generous? That is between you and the Lord. It says right here. It's between you and the Lord. But I will tell you this. If you are giving 1% or 2% of your income, you are not being generous. I'm just going to say it. You're not. And you say, well, Pastor Chris, I can't afford to do more than that. Have you seen my bills? And I'm going to tell you this. You are living outside of your means. That's just, it's a fact. And that's also between you and the Lord. That is something that you need to work out with him. And you say, well, Pastor Chris, I'm on a fixed income. I, I understand that as well. For the first two years that I was a follower of Christ, I didn't tie the red penny to the church. Nothing. And nobody ever confronted me about it. I went to church all the time. But I felt convicted about it. I felt convicted about it so much that I brought it up to pastor. 
about, hey, what do you think that a proper amount is to give? And then he said, that's between you and the Lord. I said, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I'm kind of tight on bills right now and this and that. And I, I'm having this conversation with him as I'm holding a cup of Starbucks coffee. <laughs> not even thinking about it. I love Starbucks coffee. Don't, I'm not going to get into the about Starbucks. I just like their coffee. Anyway, so he looked at me and he said, okay, I understand time, you know, people have bills, times are tight or whatever. And he looked down at my coffee cup and instantly I knew what he was going to, what he was thinking. And he said, coffee's free at church. Touche. I get it. I got it. There is always something in your life that you can cut. Always. That you can just say, I'm going to cut this out of my life because I don't need it. Is a sacrifice to the Lord. That's it. That's all it was. And if that was a cup of coffee for me per week, then that was a sacrifice, something I didn't have to have. And so if you're so tight, there's something in your life that you can sacrifice to the Lord. I'm going to tell you this right now. The church doesn't need your money. Doesn't. No church does. Because God is going to have his church alive and thrive for him, with or without you. With or without you. This is the worship between you and him. And I'm telling you right now that you will not experience true, meaningful relationship with our Lord and Savior until you can live open-handedly with him. You won't. And I can attest to that personally. Point number three this morning, whoever gives from the heart is on mission with Jesus. They're on mission with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you feel like you're forced to give, don't give. God doesn't want that money. That is not good money to him. If you feel like, man, I got to give this, put it back in your pocket. Put it back because that money is not blessed. Jesus has been after your heart since the very beginning of time. He's still after your heart. Let's read uh, Luke 21, 1 through 4. It's going to be up on the screen. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into an offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins and said truly I tell you the poor widow has put in far more than all of them for they all contributed out of their abundance but she out of her poverty put in all that she lived on it's also not about what you give the rich just put in their extra and the poor put in all that she lived on because she had trust in the Lord Jesus says that the amount that you give, it doesn't matter. I, w I was on a, a phone call this uh, week talking with uh, one of my pastor friends about, about this sermon. We, we go back and forth about sermons and what we're writing and what we're doing. And, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be uh, talking about giving and tithing. And he goes, oh, toughy. And I said, yeah, I know. And... Uh, he said, you know, I only, I only preach on, on giving about one or two times a year max. He said, I don't believe that that's something that a church needs to hear all the time. And I said, I agree with you. And, and uh, he said, I just got done doing my taxes. He said that he doesn't pay attention to what he gives throughout the year. He just writes checks and puts it in, writes checks and puts it in. He said, but I just looked at it. He said, I gave 35% last year to the church. He said, between you and I, I just gave 35%. And he said, next year I'll be on track to give more. And I said, that's, that's great. He said, and the reason why is because when I focus on giving and then focus on everything else last, I have been able to go almost completely debt-free God has taken care of my home and everything 
so well, I just give. There was another gentleman that Aaron and I, or a, a family Aaron and I got to know, and w- they invited us over for dinner. It was at least a million-dollar home and, and beautiful cars, and he had a construction business, and, and he felt compelled to give and to give and to give and to give. And, and he's what's called almost a, a reverse tither where he's giving 90 and living on 10. And I said, how? And he said, I was compelled to just give and give and give. And he said, it almost became challenging to see if I could outgive God. And you can't. He goes, I figured out you can't do it. You can't do it. He said, and when I became debt free and my business, my construction business got so busy and I had to hire and hire and hire and hire. He said, it's just, he said, it became fun to me to try to do this. And he said, to see God do so much. And maybe you're here today and giving is not your problem. Maybe, and I honestly, I have no idea who's doing what in this church. And that's, you know. But maybe that's not your thing. But maybe time is. Maybe time is something that you struggle with giving. Because there's two resources that we really have. That's time and money. That's time and money. Then maybe you need to look at your time management. And say, Lord, where can I give time? Those are our two most valuable things here on earth is time and money. But it is so great to be able to see what God can do through the resources that he has given us. Because guess what? They're already his. They're already his. They're already his. Our last point this morning is do not judge others on their giving, but joyfully give to the Lord. It is so easy for us to look around the church and pay attention to what others are giving instead of paying attention to what you are doing, your relationship to the Lord, and what you're convicted with giving. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing in the church. It doesn't matter. Remember and think about the poor lady in the Bible and the rich. Her two copper coins or two pennies meant more to the Lord than what the rich was giving. Amounts don't matter. It matters to the heart. Throughout Scripture, God always tells us, don't test me. Right? Don't test the Lord except for in Malachi 3.10. Malachi 3.10, God says, put me to the test on this. Put me to the test on this that I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. This is not God saying, give and I will have you win the lottery. That's not it at all. God is saying, give and I will replenish and take care of your needs. You get on mission with me and I will take care of your needs. That's what he's saying. I will take care of you. You will not go without. Trust me and you will not go without. If you're struggling today with your finances, I'm going to encourage you to go before the Lord on that. There is nothing that God can't work with you on and work with you through. If he can raise the dead, if he can heal the sick, he can work with you on your finances. I would encourage you to start somewhere. If you're giving nothing, then trust him with something. Trust him with something and say, Lord, I can't afford this, but I'm just going to trust you with it. If you're not trusting him with any of your time, say, Lord, show me where I can serve you. Show me where I can serve you. Say, Jesus, where's your heart? Where's your passion? Open a door for me so I can serve you. Church, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And we are here to serve his mission. As we go forward this week, want that to be our prayer. 
Don't look at the dollar amounts and feel guilty about that because that's what Satan is going to do. Satan is going to use those dollar amounts and say, well, you're not giving enough. I want you to look at the heart. Say, Lord, convict me on this. Where am I at? Is there something that I am idolizing over you? Is there something that I need to put aside so that I can worship you? Where am I? That's all. Am I spending my time where I shouldn't be? That's what I want us to do this week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that we just, above all, just put you first. That we put no other gods before you. Not that, not that it's a race. Not that, not that we want you in front of the other gods. That there's no other gods in your presence. That we just subtract them and delete them from our lives. Lord, I ask that you would just reveal in all of us what you want from us. And so that we can be at peace that we are giving to you of our resources, our time, our money, our attention we can serve you, where we can serve you on your mission. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as your Lord and personal Savior, I pray that they would make that decision, that life-changing, eternal decision today. That we are not under that old law, that we are under the new covenant that you have created. Jesus, you are that bridge between the old and eternity with you. We love you, Jesus, and we worship you. Amen.
name of Jesus. Love God, love others, and be the hands and feet of Jesus.